would like to welcome you if you're on the, look, tuning in on the broadcast this morning. Um, if you're ever around Wakefield uh, in West Yorkshire, come and see us on, at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. We'd love to see you. You'll have a great time with us, um, worshipping with so many people here. We'd love to see you all. Um, we'd love to hear from you as well. So if you drop us an email and just let us know where you're watching um, and how you're enjoying the broadcast, we'd love to hear from you. So this morning, uh, Associate Pastor, my good friend, Pastor Wes, is going to come and bring us the word this morning. So why don't we welcome us as he comes? Come on, Wes. Thank you. Well, this morning I want to talk to you from a passage from Hebrews um, chapter 4, verse 16. So if you've got your Bible, open it to there and we're going to read it. And the title of my sermon this morning is Yours for the Taking. Now, a few weeks ago, Pastor Watson Maravan Yika preached about boldly approaching God and having confidence in our faith. And when he said, I'd like to read from Hebrews 4.16, I went, oh no. Because you know when you've already planned something and God's really spoken to you. And, uh, and then I was really glad that he focused on something totally different to what God showed me to do. So today I want to focus on a different message. And let's read that verse. And it says, let us then, this is from Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now the whole subject of my sermon today is about yours for the taking, and this really stems down to one word that's in the middle of that verse, that in English we've had translated as the word receive. Okay, so... As you'll know, I really like Greek. Their yogurt tastes good, their restaurants are nice, their food's even good. Um, but the Greek word that the Bible was written in there is labano, which means that you may receive, or to take, or to take up, or to grab hold of and put in your hand, or to take on oneself. Or to sustain, to make part of, to make something that actually keeps you. To seize. Which isn't just a, you know, if you go and seize something, you're really going and you are grabbing hold of it and taking charge of it. You're seizing it, to seize upon. To cap, to capture, or to catch. To make rightful. To birth, to make part of something. Or to take, to grab hold of, to put in your satchel and make part of your provision. Okay, so it's quite a different word than just, oh, here's a gift for you. It's actually a whole word that means something a little bit more. That is, you're going to take hold of, you're going to assimilate, you're going to make it part of what you are. In fact, you're going to catch hold of this, you're going to seize it, you're going to grab hold of it, and you are going to make it part of yours. Let's just read that verse again. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that you may receive mercy. Yeah. It's not just that you go there and it is lavished upon you. This is you go to the throne of grace. You go to the God's throne and you take hold of God's mercy. Take hold of God's mercy. And, keep on reading, and that you will find, you'll find grace that will help you in your time of need. And that sentence could literally read, that last sentence as well, could literally read that you're going to find favor, a remedy, yeah. help, a fix, a solution yeah. for us at an appropriate time at an opportune time, in the right time. Okay, so it's not just, yeah, there's a little bit of something there if you need it. No, no, this is going to be a lasting remedy, a fix. Not a one-off, just a little bailout. This is going to be something that's going to change the situation altogether that is going to be very suitable for your situation. So in a verse, in, in a, this verse in a nutshell, come to God. Come with confidence in your salvation. 
take hold of God's mercy. Find grace and get the remedy that God intends for your situation and your problem right now. Now this, this verse to me I've always read as being quite a, we just, we humbly approach God and uh, we shyly maybe ask for God's provision. And you know what, if, if God feels willing at that moment, maybe he'll bestow something upon us. And God really got hold of me with this verse. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Hang on a minute. So I'm not sheepishly walking into God's presence. I'm supposed to confidently go and walk into God's presence and not just receive it, but actually go and seize it and seize hold of the grace that God's got for me. And whilst I'm there, I can also find grace and I can also find everything that I'm going to need for my time of need and the remedy that fixes it. And I'm supposed to confidently go and get it. And that seems like quite a different concept to how I'd so often read this verse before as being a a sheepishly entering God's presence. And uh, this simple message is not just about God has got a provision. God has. God's provision is limitless. God's provision is limitless. Do you know God's provision is already there? You don't have to wait for God to save up enough money to be able to provide what you need It's already there. If I wanted to go out and buy something very expensive, I could have a look through my bank balances and decide, uh, no, no, no. Then I go and ask for a credit card. Ooh, yes. No. When we go and ask for something from God, we haven't got to go and check the bank balance. The bank balance is already there. We don't have to look at what the credit card limit is. It's already there. Everything we need is already provided. It's not a case that we have to go and try and plead and persuade the bank manager or the credit card company or your wife or your husband that you really need to have this. This is something that God says already provided all that you need. That is, that is the way God provides these things. So it's not a message about the provision of God. That's already sorted. All we have needed, his hand has provided. It's quite simple. In Psalm 50, verse 10, every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything, everywhere, all the provision, his. The gold in every mine, who put it there? The diamonds, who created them? Wealth, even bitcoins are a product of what God enabled and allowed to take place. For those of you who don't know what Bitcoins are, they're a virtual currency that we're supposed to all be using by now, just like we're supposed to have paperless offices, just like we're supposed to have, be able to telepathically communicate with everything in the whole world. Who knows what the future is going to hold, but I know that it's not outside of what God's plans are, but what God's provision is, and through the middle of it, God will always find a way for people to find him and for his glory to be to be ruling over the earth. So I don't know what, it, what the future of a cattle on a thousand hills are going to be, but I know that all provision that you need, God has already got. Everything you need, he's already got. And don't forget, Jesus said if a son comes to his father and asks for bread, he's not going to give him a stone. He's not going to... God wants to richly bless us. Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house... Test me in this, says Lord Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. That whole principle of not just a wetting in the bottom of your cup, but overflowing, pouring over, running over, no more capacity could possibly go in it. And actually, even if you were to grow your capacity, it would still be full and overflowing. Because sometimes as Christians, we feel that we've got a measure from God and we've got a little bucket Then we feel like we stretch ourselves up and we grow our bucket and then we feel like our bucket's now half empty. But actually, if God is continuously filling your bucket, it doesn't matter how big you grow in God, he still wants to fill you up. He still wants to bless you. He still wants you to overflow with all the good things that God has got for you. But we've got to go and seize it. We've got to go and take hold of it. The issue of 
God not having enough is very, very simple. More than enough. Every single time. It's not even a maybe. It's more than enough. We're not just talking about financial things here. Do you know when it comes to your emotion and your feelings and your turmoil that you might go through in your head, do you know God has more than enough provision for you? Your situation is not more dire than God's provision. It's not. The stuff that you might be thinking about, the, the issues that you might have in your body, in your emotions, in your health, in your family, in your friendships, do you know you are not outside of God's miraculous? You're not. You never can escape what God's miraculous situation and provision for you can be. Your satisfaction, your purpose, your real sense of achievement, you name it, no matter what it is, God has a provision for you, already provided. It's perfect. His provision is very potent. It's powerful, and its supply is already there, waiting and accessible for you. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we love. That's the God that is there. If you make God any smaller than that, you're making God diminutive and taking him away from the truth that he is. And once you start to say, well, God can't do that for me, why not? He is abundantly more than able. The only limiting factor in this is you. You know the analogy, we've all seen these analogies before, where God writes you a check. You take the check for a million pounds, and you put it in your pocket. I've got a million pounds in my pocket. Well, it's actually no good until you actually go and put it in the bank and turn it into money and go and do something with the money. Because the check in your pocket is worthless. With the current interest rates, the check in the bank is worthless. But the check turned into money that goes and does something is worth something. The parable of the talents, Jesus gave guys talents, 10, 5, 1. What did one go and do? Nothing. What reward did he get? Nothing. What did he achieve? Nothing. And it's what we go and take hold of that we go and make something out of that God has got for us that is the important thing that I want to get through to you today. Our Christian walk is not defined by the potential that we have. Hear that. Amongst this room, we have some incredible potential in people. I look at my daughters and I look at the potential that they've got and I think, wow, God, their potential is incredible. But it's just that one thing, potential. What we need to keep doing is trying to convert the potential that God has planted in each and every one of us into something that God can then anoint and make miraculous and change into something that is incredibly dynamic, that's real, that's achievable, that it stops being potential but becomes actual. Because the potential of somebody might be great, but what they actually achieve could be far below their potential. Do you know God has given you great potential? And when you put God's provision on top of your potential, something happens that becomes more miraculous than even your potential was going to be. And what God can enable you to do takes your potential, raises the bar, and enables you to do it and do even more miraculous things. Not for your glory, for his glory, because that's the way he does it. If you look at your natural potential, do you know God wants you to do more than your natural potential is? Even if you've got a lazy personality, all it takes is coming back to God with the right attitude, taking hold of all that God's got planned for you, and you can see God do some amazing things, including giving you a real sense of drive and purpose and determination to really get hold of what God wants you to do and go and march into it and go and do it. Take this verse from Matthew 10, 38. And Jesus said, anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I'm really glad that Jesus took up his responsibility and died on a cross. Because I don't have to. Because I'm not sure I could. Jesus came, he died, he forgave our sins, he made a way for us 
to be in communion with God and he opened the door to this new life that we can have. Thank you, Jesus, for paying that price once and for all, finished, never again. Thank you for opening the door for me. Jesus took on his responsibility. Each one of us has our own cross. It's incredibly unique. It's our purpose. It's our plan. It's what are we called to do that God has planned for us to do. And are we taking hold of that? Are we actually walking towards it, planning towards it, or are we taking our potential of what you could be and just saying, it's there, great. But I'm not going to actually take hold of my cross and do it. Do you know the same word there for take? Take up your cross is the same word as in the Hebrews. It's exactly the same, taken. In Hebrews, we had it translated as receive, but it's actually to grab hold of. Jesus said, go and grab hold of your cross. It's the same word that's in the middle of that. Take hold of your cross and follow me. Take hold of your purpose. Take hold of the thing that you need to do that might be a struggle, that might seem like a strain, but take hold of it and achieve it and follow me. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Imagine some of the things that God could do with you. Do you know those imaginations? Do you know who planted them there? God. Do you know some of those dreams that you've hidden in the bottom of your heart that you've thought, they're silly, this is me, I live in Wakefield, I can't really do that. Do you know who planted them there? God. Do you know who's going to grow them? God. Do you know who's got the provision for those things to actually become reality? God. Do you know some of those things that you'd hidden that you thought they have I've passed the opportunity of those happening? Great. That's actually quite a good way to live life. Because when you know that you can't, God can. That's the truth. What you think is impossible with God is possible. When I when I was called into the ministry here, a prophet came and he called me out and he sat me down on a chair about there. And uh, I rolled my eyeballs at him. Because it's very different having a secret of something that's down in your heart that you think, that's between me and God. And actually, it starts to become very difficult when other people know what your secret is. When other people have an inkling that they know what you should be doing, you get encouragement from them. And then when you don't take hold of that, they go. Or at least you think they're going... You know what I'm saying with that. You've all seen when you think somebody should be doing something and they're not doing it and you feel like you want to give them a good, a right royal kick up the backside in brotherly love. Because you know this is part of what God's plan for them is. You know, it's easier for everybody else to see that and know that sometimes than it is for you to admit it to yourself. But God wants us to be so determined that people around us even know what we're supposed to be doing. God knows what we're supposed to be doing. You know what you're supposed to be doing. Just get out there and do it and stop being scared of it because that verse says we've got to confidently, with boldness, approach God's throne and get what we need. That's what this verse says. Confidently go and get it. Confidently take hold of it. In Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32... Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God and he uses the illustration of a mustard seed. And we all know mustard seed stands for faith. Faith the size of a mustard seed can say what to this mountain. And, you know, mustard seed illustration is something that's, that's pretty small but pretty potent. Matthew 13, 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which a man took. Guess what the word is? Took grabbed hold of, a man took hold of a mustard seed and planted it in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. This is exactly the same principle from Hebrews. It's the same principle that's had throughout the whole of the Bible that God wants to provide. We've got to take hold of it. We've got to do something with it and make it into something that is really useful. Because the man had to take hold of 
the mustard seed. You have to take hold of that illustration of faith and do something with it. And the doing something with it here was planting it so that it grows into a tree. The doing something with it is saying to the mountain, be removed into the sea. The doing something with it is enacting it in your life so that the plans and the purposes that you know God's got planned for your life, you're taking hold of, you're planting it, you're doing something with it, and it is growing to help you achieve what some of God's plans for you are. Let's not forget, there's a verse in John 3, verse 27. And John is replying, and he says, A man can receive only what is given from heaven. Guess what the word receive is there? So a man can only actually really take hold of from God what has been provided, given from heaven to him. Do you know you're not going to be able to take hold of something that God didn't want you to take hold of? Apart from worry, trouble, unbelief, lack of faith, and stuff that isn't godly. But when it's a godly something, the only thing you're going to be able to take hold of is what God wants to provide for you. Because God's provided it for you. So ask big. Ask for lots. Ask for a diverse bunch of stuff that you don't even think you know yet. Do you know why? Because if God wants you to have it, he'll give it to you and you can take it. Because he's not going to give you something that you don't need or he hasn't planned for you because a man can only take what is given to him from heaven. You're not going to be able to take it unless God has provided for you. In Matthew 7 verse 8, everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door will be open to him. But if you're not asking, and you're not taking, and you're not pushing any doors, do you know what you're going to get back out at the end of it? Not very much. God can still, thankfully, by grace, lavish, pour out, even when we haven't asked, more than we could hope for. God, thank you that you do that to us. But actually, let us learn the principle that God says, let's go ask, take. And I know that sounds a little bit, it's not very British, is it? We like to stand in queues and actually we'll let somebody else in front of us and we'll let somebody else in front of us. And if there's none left when we get to the front of queue, unless it's a church function, of course, if there's none left when we get to the front of the queue, it's okay as long as other people have enjoyed it. Do you know with God, there's no queuing system. The queue is you. The front of the queue is you. The provision is not depleted because of other people that are also accessing God. All of your provision, your single unique provision, is entirely there with everything that you could ever want within it, waiting for you to access it. And the moment you access it, it's already still full again. It's incredible. It is incredible. In John 6, verse 35, Jesus declared that he is the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is everything that we need. Great, but it also we need a whole bunch of other stuff that comes because of, firstly, Jesus. Hear me on this? Firstly, Jesus. You don't need a million pounds written on a check in your pocket to access Jesus first. The first thing you access is Jesus. That opens the bank account for you to be able to put the check in. The check might have already been written, but actually you need to have Jesus first before you can do anything else. If you want to access all that God's got for you, put Jesus first because he is the bread of life. If you come to him, you'll never go hungry, and if you believe in him, you'll never be thirsty. Then there's this great verse from Isaiah 55. That says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. That sounds like a really good market. It does. I would love to go shopping. We're not going to go to Aldi on this day. We're going to go to Marks and Spencers on this day. Where the cost is free. The cost is already provided. Do you know why there is nothing that you can do to earn anything from God? Nothing. That's really what this verse is about. There is absolutely nothing. Goodwill, good deeds, being friendly to people doesn't open up 
a portion of blessing to you. It doesn't open up some of God's provision for you. It is there limitless without you doing anything. You can't top it up. You can't paint it a different color. You can't make it a little bit sweeter. You can't do anything with it. It's already everything in abundance of what you need. You don't owe God anything. You don't come with anything before God that's worthy because he is God. He doesn't need anything from us, but he chooses to lavish and make an awesome provision for each and every one of us. His grace just gives it to us unconditionally. Even if you've been a really bad person, it's still there. Even if you've done a whole bunch of really naff stuff in life, do you know what? The same pot of provision that God made for you is still all there. It's not changed. Its tap hasn't been turned down. As soon as you come before God in the right way with a repentant heart, things change and God says, here it is. We just got to go and take it. In Matthew 10 verse 8, Jesus says, freely you have received. Guess what the word is there? Freely. Freely he's given to you and you've received. But he follows it up with freely give. Freely you've taken hold of, now freely give. And that is one of the great principles of being a Christian, is that we, we learn the principle of we get, we give, and actually we plant, we make work, and we, it comes through us, and God's blessing and God's love shows through us. Because what's the point in being a billionaire recluse that doesn't change anything? You know, you hear of these stories about somebody that won millions of pounds and they left it in the bank accounts and carried on working and doing everything they did and never lived it and it wasn't anything and they die lonely, sad, without anything. And actually, God's made a great provision for each and every one of us to access, to take hold of and to use. So here's a really great principle that uses this word of taking again from Jesus feeding the multitudes. So Matthew 15, verse 36. Jesus took, grabbed hold of, seized the seven loaves and the fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. They in turn gave them to the people. And afterwards, he's trying to help them explain all of this in Matthew 16, verse nine. Do you still not understand? Don't you remember how the five fish Uh, Five loaves fed the 5,000, and how many basketfuls you took? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 people, and how many basketfuls you took? Do you know, God's provision for us is awesome. They didn't have anything. What they had, they gave to Jesus, who took hold of it, spread it, fed all these people, fed all those people, thousands of people, and still the disciples went home with a massive amount more than they ever arrived to Jesus' feet with. That's what the principle of this is. But had they have not taken hold of those, that bread and that fish off that boy and given it to Jesus, they'd have never been able to go and take back 12 basketfuls of food at the end that was much more than they'd ever taken to Jesus in the first place. That's exactly the same in our lives. We give our lives to Jesus. It's a small offering. What do we get back? An incredible abundance that's more than we can ever possibly imagine. That's the principle here. Here's a few other insights into taking what God has for you. In Matthew 21, 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Matthew 21, 22. Guess what the word is in the middle of there? If you believe, you will receive be able to grab hold of whatever you ask for in prayer. How many times have we asked a prayer for God, but we've left our hands, well, probably like this. Maybe like this. And actually the verse says, ask for it in prayer, and then go seize it. That's what the Greek word there is. This isn't just that it will be lavished on you. This is a go and take, go and take it. Start to pray some prayers that say, 
I'm going to ask for this in faith, and I am going to go and take it from the throne of grace, from God's throne room, from heaven. I'm going to go and receive, take what I've asked for in prayer. This is a whole new, was a whole new insight for me when God opened my eyes to this that stopped just being, God, please bless me, and started to say, God, you've already made the provision. I'm coming to get some. Not just, please, God, let thousands of pounds fall on my letterbox, but actually God's given us all the ability to go and make that work and go and get it. Not just saying, God, please let the phone ring for somebody to be able to make me feel better about myself when God says, you've already got everything that's there. Go and do it. Go and take hold of it. And immediately, something, the miracle comes. When, God say, when you're saying, I want Mr. or Mrs. Wright to just walk up to me and say that they've been waiting for me the whole of my life if you're single, keep praying that prayer. But do you know what? God can also say, go and find that person. Go and live the life that says that you want that person. Who knows what God can provide? But if you believe, you can receive. You can go and take whatever you ask for in prayer. How about this from Acts 1 verse 8? Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will seize power. It's that same word again. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you'll be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you can then go and seize something from God and go and do something incredibly dramatic that will be life-changing, that will take your potential of what could have been and turn your potential into the actual of what God has got planned for you. In Hebrews 11 verse 13, it talks about great men of faith. For those of you who've been involved and you've um, accessed the night school of the word, if you haven't, I'd recommend that you do. There were some great men of faith that were still living by faith when they died. In Hebrews 11 13, it says they did not receive the things that were promised. They hadn't taken hold of all that God had promised for them. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. But actually, God wants you to take hold of all of the plans that he's got for you. He wants you to take hold and achieve the great potential that he's put in your life. The new covenant that Jesus died for us has made a way for you to achieve more than anybody has ever achieved in the Old Testament or before because you've got the miracle power of God and the Holy Spirit working through you, working with you. God is an awesome, miracle-working God. But he needs us to go and seize hold of our futures, to seize hold of God's plans for us, to seize hold of the provision that he's got for you. There's a great verse in Ephesians 1 verse 3 that says, Praise be to God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And I love this whole concept that God doesn't just give you a little bit of what you need. He gives you every aspect of everything that you need. For some people, they need some financial provision from God. For some people, they need a better faith in God. For some people, they need relationships. I don't know what it is that you need today, but I know the man who's got it all under control and has made a provision already for you. It's there. Whatever you need today, whatever you need for tomorrow, whatever you need to achieve the plans and the purposes that God has got planned for you is already provided. It just needs you to go and seize it take hold of it. God wants to meet all your needs. That's simple. And you know, the Bible is filled with places where God just blessed people absolutely abundantly. If you haven't read it, I'd recommend you read Ezra. And the story of Ezra in Ezra 7 particularly, Ezra wanted to do what God wanted for them. He he had a plan, he wanted to live it right, And you've got this verse in Ezra 7 verse 10 where it says that the hand of God was upon him. And he went to this mighty king that he was being enslaved by and the king basically wrote him a letter that said, everything that you need, you can have. It was a letter that basically gave limitless resources from one of the most powerful kings. This wasn't even a godly king, but it was part of God's will And so Ezra could go and get whatever he wanted. 
gold, wine, oil, sheep, cattle, people. It didn't matter. It's all provided there for you. And this all came because God's hand wanted Ezra to do that. And God blessed Ezra and made a provision for him. In 2 Kings verse 7, you've got this story about some lepers outside a city that's being besieged. And the city is in famine. The mums are eating their own children. Okay, just that doesn't happen in today's culture, thank you very much. But actually, that's how dire the situation was. That's how far in turmoil these guys thought they were. And God caused the miracle to happen where the whole camp of enemies deserted and left it because God made a mighty sound and thought there was this huge army coming, so they all deserted. So you've got guys in a city on this side complaining about their life. On the other side, you've got a miracle provision that God's already made of a fully-fledged army with cattle, sheep, food, gold, silver, tents, clothes, and everything in it. And you've got people in the city not going and taking the provision that God had made for them. And it took a couple of lepers to actually go and get it, take it. And you've got this place where they said to each other in 2 Kings 7 verse 9 what we're doing is not right we actually need to go and tell everybody about the provision that God has made for us do you know God wants you to be a blessing to other people God wants you to be a blessed people but he wants you to go and take hold of it so Hebrews 4.16 let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence Not just in our own salvation, but actually with the confidence that we may receive to go and seize our salvation of mercy. To find the grace provision that God's got for us and to get everything we need to sort us out in our time of need. When you need confidence to approach God, it's already provided. Jesus has already died. So everything you need to approach the throne room of God is already there. The price has already been paid. And as long as you've made that decision to follow Jesus Christ, and if you haven't today, do before you leave this place. I need to sort my life out. I need to follow Jesus Christ and do what is right and I know is right. And little by little, things will change in my life, but I'm making that decision today to follow Jesus then you can already approach God's throne room and say, okay, I'm confidently going to do it. Why? Because Jesus died for me. Do you know when you need forgiveness for either unbelief or for a lack of doing something right or because you've made mistakes? It's already provided. When you need help in your time of need, it is already provided. It's already there. You've just got to take it. When you need your confidence, go and take it. Do you know God doesn't want you to be a weak, fearful Christian? And if you feel weak and fearful, come and grab hold of some of the confidence of God that says, I am a Christian. I have got God on my side and God is causing all things to work together for my good. And whether I feel like I'm a weak Christian or not, I'm going to confidently Say, I've got Jesus Christ living with me, God going for me. He who's with me is greater than he who's against me. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens me. I'm no longer weak. I'm now going to be confident to go and do what God's got for me. Whatever you need, it's provided. Go and take it. Whatever you need, it is already there. So just go and access the storeroom of heaven. If you need a new job, go and take it. Don't wait for a job application to come. Go and apply for the job. Who knows what God has got out there for you? I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not, but I know that God always wants to bless his people and he wants to bless you with good jobs. God wants to bless you with financial stability. So firstly, stop doing financially stupid things and secondly, start trusting in God for your financial stability. God wants to provide you with a good family. So work hard at it. Be part of his family here. Go and take hold of all the goodness that God wants for you in family. If you need a physical healing, take hold of it. Not just in an ethereal faith, physically take hold of it and start to stretch yourself a little bit to say, God has 
have this confident speak over you. God has provided my miracle. You might be waiting for all the outworkings of that to take place, but if God's got your miracle provided for, take hold of it, own it, and be it. If you need friends, if you need a miracle change in your circumstance, if you need a different attitude, if you need energy, if you need forgiveness, if you need a new hope, if you think that it's just take hold of it from God because God will provide all that you need in a very, very unique way. Everything you need is already at the feet of Jesus, already provided. The one key, we need to go into his presence. We need to take that check into the bank and turn it into something we can really use. We need to go to heaven and grab hold of it and say, God, I'm taking hold of this. I'm taking hold of what I'm going to ask for in prayer by faith that's part of your will for me. And we can say, we can confidently approach God's throne of grace and take hold of mercy, find grace, and help us in our time of need. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for all of your provision. Lord, thank you for your unique plan for each and every one of us. And today, Lord, I pray that you will help us to take hold of, to seize hold of that which you've provided for us. Lord, help us not be limited by our own mindset. Let us not be limited by our Britishness or our Yorkshireness or by anything else, but let us just access the fullness of all that you've laid aside for us, that limitless, potent plenty that you've got for each and every one of us. Lord, help us to not just reach our potential, but help us with you achieve far more than our potential is for your glory. Lord, let us be dynamic people that have taken hold of all that you've got for us. Lord, today I pray that people that feel they've missed it will find a new sense of hope. People who may be asking emptily will find a place where they know you're saying to them, this is provided for you, take hold of it. Where people's lives will change where people today will just take hold of you and your salvation, if nothing else, Lord, and they'll understand that that is the greatest miracle ever, is that they've got a savior and a friend called Jesus. Lord, bless each and every person here today. Lord, strengthen them as they take hold of things and they start to do things that are new in their lives as you've called them to. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.